Welcome to the U.S.-China Global Education Television Series, presented by the Confucius Institute, U.S. Center, in partnership with the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. This 10-part series brings together presidents of the universities and cultural institutions that host the Confucius Institute, along with distinguished American business, diplomatic, and educational leaders to discuss the importance of global education, language development, and people-to-people -people exchange between the United States and China. My name is Tony Kelly Foster, and I'm the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Our focus is on global education, international affairs, and global communications. Like the Confucius Institute U.S. Center, we build educational bridges and advance international understanding between students, teachers, and professionals in the United States, China, and worldwide. We have a valued strategic partnership with the Confucius Institute, U.S. Center. Their focus is on Chinese language development, global education, and people-to-people -people exchanges between the United States and China. It's my honor today to be here with my friend and colleague, Professor Gao Qing, the Executive Director of the Confucius Institute U.S. Center, who will introduce our program today. Thank you, Tony. Dr. Leslie Wang serves as President of San Francisco State University, one of the nation's primary urban comprehensive universities. He leads more than 3,000 faculty and staff, as they serve a student population of over 30,000. Dr. Wang is committed to providing San Francisco State University students with an exceptional educational experience forged in the intellectual energy of one of the world's most innovative cities. He also launched San Francisco State University's first comprehensive fundraising campaign to provide the resources necessary to support the needs of San Francisco State students in the 21st century, as well as innovative research and creative projects. Prior to his appointment at San Francisco State University in 2012, Dr. Wang serves as president of Northern Michigan University. Now, let's join Dr. Wang, who will begin this important dialogue. Professor Gao, thank you for a most gracious introduction. John Chang was born to Taiwanese parents who immigrated to the United States. Chang's father, Chang Mudong, a Ping Tung native of Hakka descent from Naipu, relocated to the United States in 1950 to pursue graduate studies uh, at Case Western University. After graduating with a degree in chemical engineering from National Taiwan University. Shang's mother, Shen Yanxiang, was a Tainan native and who studied abroad in Japan before immigrating to the United States to pursue further studies. Uh, Chang's parents met and then soon married. Chang was born in New York City, grew up in Chicago. He studied, uh, attended Carl Sandburg High School, where he served as student body vice president alongside student body president Dave Jones. Lifelong friends, Chang and Jones ran together in 2010 on the California Democratic slate, with Chang winning uh, re-election as state controller and Jones uh, being elected California insurance commissioner. Chang graduated with honors with a degree in finance from the University of South Florida and earned a law degree from Georgetown University Law Center. His decision to pursue law was influenced by his maternal grandfather, Shen Rong, who was a prominent lawyer in Tainan. In 1987, Chang moved to Los Angeles and began his career as a tax law specialist for the Internal Revenue Service. He then worked as an attorney for California State Controller Gray Davis and also served on the staff of Senator Barbara Boxer of California. In 1997, Chang was appointed to the Board of Equalization and was elected in November 2006 as the state's independent fiscal watchdog. John Chang took immediate action to weed out waste, fraud, and abuse of public funds 
and made the state finances more transparent and accountable to the public. Chang has vigorously challenged both the governor and the legislature to address the state's serious budget crisis, offering plans to hold the politicians responsible for passing a budget on time. Chang has used his independent auditing powers to identify over $9.5 billion in government waste, fraud, and inefficiency, more than any previous controller in California history. Chang has long championed financial literacy and works to empower working families, women, seniors, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations through seminars and free tax preparation assistance. In his recent campaign to be elected governor of California, he stated that every Californian deserves the opportunity to live the American dream. When his parents arrived in this country in the early 1950s, dreaming of a better future, they never gave up. He ran for governor to make sure the future his parents were able to provide for him and his siblings became a reality for all California families. John is the only person in California history to hold the state's three top financial offices as a member on the Board of Equalization, State Controller, and State Treasurer. As California's 33rd State Treasurer, he serves as California's banker, overseeing trillions of dollars in transactions every year. It is my honor today to welcome my friend and, and colleague, John Chang, Treasurer, State of California, to the campus of San Francisco State University to participate in the prestigious U.S.-China Global Education Television Series. John, it's an honor to have you here today and interview you, and um, uh, it's very, very special for me. And, and John, you've served as a California State, you serve as the California State Treasurer, and previously as the State Controller and member of the Board of Equalization. In fact, you're the only person in California history to hold all three positions. What led you to dedicate your life to a career in public service? Uh, I feel blessed that I've had the opportunity to serve uh, in each of those positions. Uh, I, I think about the economic struggle that everyday California families face. It's like my parents struggle when my parents came to this country with very little money. Uh, when you think about you know, how you put food on the table or how do you pay to get a enriching education or how do you pay for housing? And we know in California here in San Francisco, uh, it's not easy. Many families are overwhelmed uh, by the cost of housing, uh, the cost of transportation. And so when I get to think about how do we fund and finance uh, the world's fifth largest economy, I think about you know, my neighbor, I think about my own family, I think about my friends. Uh, so I feel very fortunate that, you know, I can try to help ease uh, the hardship that they're facing in their life. And so uh, I'm, even though a lot of people don't think much about the financial positions, they don't care about the numbers, uh, what I see in the numbers of the state of California are the values mm -hmm. and the quality of life. Uh, right for you, the uh, the state has not done its job in making sure that we have kept up our investment in higher education. And so we've shifted more of that burden, we shifted more of that risk onto students. And that's why students continue to, too many of them graduate with debt. And for many of them, it's incredibly overwhelming and they're working, unfortunately, not a decade or two decades. Uh, I have staff in the uh, treasurer's office uh, in senior positions where their kids are entering college, and yet my senior staff member is still paying for his college loans. Mm. The value of education is, is a powerful one for families and communities. Um, what role did your parents' journey to the United States have in, in shaping your own professional life? Yeah, my feet on this uh, earth in the United States of America is, uh, you know, is, I can imagine my parents, they came here because America provided them the very best opportunity to get a world-class education. Uh, my dad came here at considerable sacrifice to get his PhD in chemical engineering. English was his fifth language. Uh, when I Googled my dad, you know, over a decade ago, and my dad passed away 
in the 1990s, uh, I was looking and I saw a bit of his dissertation and thinking, oh my God, my dad was so brilliant. And I knew, I knew he was brilliant. But you're thinking here, you're writing a doctorate, your thesis in your fifth language, trying to learn it, right? But it just, it shows what, you know, the, the human spirit, human will, uh, that it can, it can conquer most, if not all. Wonderful. John, interesting family. Um, how has your cross-cultural and international background strengthened your ability uh, to be an effective public service, philanthropic, legal, community development, and educational advocate and leader? I think it, it assists me to understand the human story. Uh, my parents being immigrants, uh, the struggle, as I mentioned, that they overcame, uh, understanding that we come from different places on this globe. Uh, we speak different languages, love different foods, uh, have different backgrounds, different histories, have our own stories. But we come together because we have common aspirations. Uh, people want to have strong families. They want to do work that's meaningful. They want to have a, a positive lifestyle. Many of them want to give back, uh, serve uh, the community, the state, the nation uh, that they reside in. And so how do we bring people who have disparate backgrounds together uh, to form new communities, to understand, uh, despite the fact that 99% of us are biologically the same, uh, oftentimes we exacerbate the differences, uh, but they don't have to be differences that divide. Uh, we can celebrate the best of each other and create something really special. You know, the richness of family backgrounds and experience, et cetera, really has a powerful effect on leaders such as yourself to get into public service and serve. Um, the issues just become much more clear. California has a, a long established, large and vibrant Chinese American community um, that really reflects a blend of both cultures, strong work values, like you're saying. What is your perspective on the contribution of Chinese Americans in California and some of the work that you've done? Well, I'm really proud of your work here. Uh, we celebrate education because education is the key to the American dream. But education was not always publicly available and universally accessible uh, to all Americans. Uh, er, the earlier cases uh, involved discrimination, uh, lack of access to education, and in fact, it was a Chinese family here in San Francisco that litigated the case that ultimately stated that uh, individuals are entitled to a public education. So the Chinese American and their values helped drive uh, today uh, what is something that should be universally and legally universally accepted the right to a public education. Well, and, and we take that seriously in California, the, the university system, the community colleges, the uh, K through 12s, there really is a deep commitment to lifting everyone. And thus the economy, the lifestyle of California is rich, very diverse. Well, you're part of the largest institution of higher education in the United States of America, the Cal State University System. We know that the Cal State University System is transformational, transformative uh, in so many individuals' lives. When you rank the colleges uh, and acceptance rates, taking uh, kids, young adults, older adults from the bottom 20% and moving them up into the 20%, fulfilling the promise of the American dream, uh, you, uh, your leadership, part of a larger institution is absolutely critical. Uh, this state needs to continue the steps that it has been taking in regards to reinvesting, uh, because we dropped that investment for a significant period of time, in higher education. We know that we compete in a global economy. Uh, we work with China, we work with Asia, we work with individuals from all continents. Uh, we know that artificial intelligence, virtual reality, automation is gonna create some severe dislocation uh, for a lot of individuals. Those old, good-paying, middle-class jobs are disappearing uh, with this generation and the next generation. So it is incumbent that we have new thinking and that we understand that it's gonna require lifelong learning uh, to adapt to the changes that are happening immediately, rapidly in today's society. Well, and, and you've been a leader in making sure that opportunity is 
uh, financed well, that there's integrity to the budget. Uh, and I always think of your work relative to our students who, like you and I, when we were younger, we brought effort and a commitment to improve our families, improve our community, uh, and ultimately ourselves. Uh, and you get a great perspective on California as the treasure to see it all come together. Well, we have made extraordinary progress over the last decade. We know with that last recession, 2008-2009, uh, 1.34 million Californians lost their jobs. A lot of hardship. Uh, our economy uh, dropped a little bit. Uh, we were once the world's fifth largest economy. We had dropped to uh, various estimates, 10th to 12th largest economy on the globe. Today, we have returned to the world's fifth largest economy, a state domestic product that has increased from $2 trillion to $2.6 trillion. Mm -hmm. But uh, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, one in every five Californians lives in poverty. That's not acceptable. Uh, you understand the challenges for your students. Uh, here in the Bay Area, housing is exorbitantly expensive, right? And you're pushing people into poverty, and that's not acceptable. Uh, so as state treasurer, I, I work on the financing. In my previous positions, the state, I worked on the funding, right? Funding and financing are different uh, to try to build a stronger economic financial foundation for all of California. Are we putting in place a sound pathway uh, to invest in the things that are important for California? Education, healthcare, roads, bridges, uh, technology, uh, so that we can propel the state to continue to move forward. Well, and, and I'm reminded of that when I see students um, spending lots of time in the library, they're holding down two and three jobs, et cetera. I'm really proud of my students because um, when I finally get out of my office, it's usually late at night and I have to walk by the library at 10, 11, and it's full. Students are in front of their computers, they're doing their work, et cetera. Uh, and that's where your work, our work together to, to really push young people through education um, is paying off for California. It's uh, w without a world-class education, you're, you're going to have a tough time making it uh, in the future. So uh, it takes a community of people to make sure that individuals are successful. One of the great things about uh, SFSU uh, and other places is that you bring caring, knowledgeable people who want to improve a lot of others. So uh, these are opportunities, uh, unfortunately, that not everybody gets to access. Uh, so when they walk onto uh, this campus, right, they know that they have a life-changing, an extraordinary enriching environment uh, that can help people pursue whatever dreams they may hold. And it's we're, we're quite proud of our mantra here that students first and the faculty want to teach, they want to do research, but ultimately it's about students and helping them come close to their dreams and finding that path forward. Yeah, what's very exciting is watching people grow. Right? Oh, you you see people over years and they come in and you just watch them flourish. Uh, you watch them flower and uh, be people that are can take mo take on more responsibility not only for themselves but the other people in their lives. Mm -hmm. John, from from the treasurer's perspective in your life in public service, California has a very unique three part system of community colleges, uh, over a hundred of them spread around the state. Uh, 23 CSU campuses, 10 uh, University of California campuses, the premier system. What's your sense of the role of that entire system in pushing California forward? Well, we are the world's fifth largest economy because of that higher education system. The, we have 11 of the top 100 universities in the United States of America. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, we're very excited about what's happening with especially the CSU system because a num number of them are ranked in the top 25 in elevating individuals who come from oftentimes very difficult circumstances and providing them in the top 20% of income earners. And we know life's more than just how much money you make. 
but providing them with an opportunity not only to change their lives, but to change their families' lives. So many of these families come from generations of poverty. Uh, but once they touch, you know, this place that's, you know, as the Chinese, when they immigrated this country, called it, you know, the gold mountain, they've, they've reached that gold mountain, uh, and we're doing it uh, together. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, the world is, is such a place right now that universities and cities and robust economies like California pull in people from all over the world to a common workplace, common communities, et cetera. I'm, I'm really interested in how you perceive that mix of the international community within California and particularly on campus. Well, we're a state of nearly 40 million strong. Uh, last estimates, 39.8 million people who come from uh, every country. And so it's a celebration of hope. It's a celebration of courage. Uh, and it's a, it's, a hard, it's a hard mix at times. Uh, people trying to understand each other's values, people trying to understand each other's language. But that's what makes this place incredibly unique. And then when it works, you provide the best opportunities because when people share themselves, when they share their culture, when they share their dreams, uh, right, you open up the world. When we interview uh, seniors, when they're getting close to graduation, one of our questions is, what was most attractive about being at San Francisco State? That they give the same speech that you just gave, oh, that it's, the campus is diverse, there are people from all around. You would be interested, my wife and I have a little contest. We go to the library for a cup of coffee, and we time how long it takes 10 languages to go by us listening to students. <laughs> and uh, we've never sat there more than 45 minutes. And, and uh, I, I couldn't name the languages, but it was just so fascinating to know that the world is in the library, yeah, you know, in front of us as educators. Well, let's, let's take that theme and, and talk about California as uh, maybe a place the world would like to invest in money, talent, uh, et cetera. Um, how do you see California playing a role in that world economy, that complexity that you're speaking of? Well, we were just speaking about the campus at San Francisco State University. We talked about this state being nearly 40 uh, million people strong. Uh, it's a great place to invest because we have that diversity. And so we have people who are coming from every country that is here. And so we're, we are open to those ideas. And we're also known for our incredible innovation. Why is this place the state of innovation? Part of it is because of our diversity. When you have people who have different backgrounds uh, and they share those ideas with each other uh, as they continue to welcome uh, these new ideas, we spark the future. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's in technology, whether it's our world famous entertainment, whether it's the fact that we're the breadbasket uh, for this country in regards to food, there's innovation in every corner, in every county, in every city in this state. John, recently you, you took a trip to China uh, with other elected public officials and business entrepreneurs from, from California to, to seek out mutually beneficial opportunities. Uh, can you comment about that? What were some of the priorities? What were some of the issues uh, our colleagues from around the world raised with you? So I went to China three times uh, last year. I led two delegations, a delegation of uh, Northern California elected officials and uh, individuals in the high tech industry. I led a delegation uh, from Southern California consisting of elected officials and also business leaders. And then I went over and spoke uh, in Beijing uh, at a healthcare mm -hmm. conference. And so people express different things. One of the focuses of one of the uh, delegation trips was a focus on transportation, uh, looking at our high-speed rail system. Uh, China is engaged in significant investment uh, in their infrastructure. Uh, the California, if we're gonna continue to be a thriving, blossoming economy needs to upgrade our infrastructure. And what both countries and the whole world 
uh, need to recognize that as we upgrade our infrastructure, we need to make sure that we're sensitive to climate change. Uh, we have an existential responsibility to each other. We know that if you have the temperatures of this globe increasing too dramatically, uh, it's going to have an impact on individuals' respiratory capabilities. It's going to have an impact, especially if you live along the coast. You look here in San Francisco, uh, by 2100, year 2100, we're looking at a sea level rise anywhere of 36 inches, 3 feet, to one estimate having 10 feet. That is going to impact a lot of housing, natural, uh, our beaches, uh, as we see sea level rise. We saw, unfortunately, with California uh, earlier this year or late last year, uh, 11 counties that saw the devastating effect of wildfires. Mm -hmm. So we need to be sensitive and continue to share our knowledge to engage in better practices, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is where the world's going to come closer, and that's why these exchanges, sharing technology, business practices, uh, human behavior uh, is so important. You know, you raise a really good point of creating an opportunity where a variety of people, our relationship with China can bring brilliant people to the table to seek out solutions to, to what are pretty common issues, transportation, food, education, safety, et cetera. It, it's, it, well, people talk about China being so different from us in many ways, the, the same issues, right? As California, as the United States, as uh, the whole planet, et cetera. Um, the scale of that is very dramatic. And a big issue that impacts both China and uh, the United States is that we both have rapidly aging populations. So how do we uh, take care of our, our seniors? How do we take care of our parents and our grandparents? So mm -hmm. the, uh, those are challenges economically, financially, physically. Those are uh, big questions that uh, we, we also need to share ideas and best practices. Uh, the San Francisco State is um, also uh, has many partnerships with Chinese universities, and they're very productive for us for the very reasons you know, that you mentioned, you know, again, can you, can we all set an opportunity by which cooperation might generate innovations and creativeness, et cetera? Um, after those trips, what, were there any themes that you walked away with that sort of said, why well, we, we, meaning China and the U.S. and California in particular, we better pay attention to this or let's, let's make sure we don't forget this kind of issue. Did, was there anything like that that just stood out in your mind? Well, we built really strong relationships, whether it's the discussion on water. We know that uh, California faces uh, dramatic challenges uh, in regards to access to safe, uh, quality water. China, in many respects, uh, in many of their provinces, uh, face some of the same similar issues. And so a, a lot of the ex exchanges as to some of the discussions about research, best practices, uh, climate change, transporta transportation, and then certainly uh, the United States uh, and a lot of the parties that I work with and the leaders that I work with were in interested in uh, Chinese direct investment into their capital projects and investments in businesses and building the bridges uh, so that uh, business activity could thrive on both sides of the ocean. And, and that is a fascinating idea because uh, we always talk about the world getting smaller. Um, I'm still waiting for us to talk about the world beginning, uh, becoming more effective at utilizing the talents, et cetera. And maybe that's where universities and education plays a key role between China and the United States of our students getting together, our faculty members getting together. And uh, like you said, maybe our water quality people ought to be regularly meeting with their counterparts in China to, to just simply put that energy into an issue like water safety and water availability. The whole world, right? The, uh, you have people in uh, the Middle East, uh, Israelis, uh, Arabs, uh, Palestinians who are talking about 
water issues, uh, and mm. the uh, a lot of it is with the uh, those who have great technical expertise. Oftentimes, where the politicians uh, are at loggerheads, where for the moment they're not coming together, the people, the experts are right, and so we need to make sure that we build close knit uh, ties and bonds uh, because you know. Hopefully, the, the world common sense will come together, right, and say, okay, some of our political leadership uh, right now uh, isn't working together very well, but the relationships between the people are so strong uh, that they can overcome the differences in what a What a good point. And, you know, I envision joint projects where, much like, we just sort of set students loose and say, you here are your counterparts, other students from around the world, your students from China, they have water issues, we have water issues, they need to grow food, we need to grow food. And then all of us who are older need to get out of the way and just say, young people, go do this, you know, see what you can do to provide some relief in that area. Well, the, uh, well, we don't want to push you out of the way, or me, <laughs> maybe, yeah, but right. We want to make sure that we pass on our uh, cumulative experience, right? The area, because oftentimes, as you know, the uh, the old uh, statements are the old quotes, right? Hawk, if uh, history repeats itself, so the uh, right. If you don't share those things, but uh, you're engaged in a right, committee of one hundred. It's part. It's part of those efforts, right? Off. You have a lot of our colleagues who are involved in cross border economic, philanthropic, social activity. You, you, you sparked a, a thought in me there. You know, both countries have very robust research and development, innovations, et cetera. It would be interesting to see how to bring that energy you know, together. Um, but that raises an interesting issue, particularly for me as an educator. Um, you know, in 2017, almost 350,000 Chinese students came to the U.S. Uh, they represent a large number of international students here at San Francisco State, and yet only 22,000 U.S. students went abroad. Um, seems like quite an imbalance. And so what's your thoughts about getting U.S. students to get out into the world, to, to go to China, to interact with the Chinese students? Yeah, even adjusted for population, there's still a discrepancy, right? When you talk about China with more than 1.2 billion people, the United States with uh, over 300 million people, it's, it's absolutely critical. Uh, we in the United States have been extraordinarily fortunate uh, that we've had a, a, a the world's largest economy, and people have made significant adjustments so that they can build relationships with uh, the United States and the United States business. But I think we need to expand. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, our lack of uh, uh, language command mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, either Mandarin or Cantonese. Uh, we we need to do better. Uh, other countries, it's common where they speak multiple languages, uh, and they benefit from it. Uh, we, we need to do the same. Uh, our United States students uh, are starting to understand in many respects that there are huge opportunities. Uh, they're excited, you know, as I pointed out, by food, culture, art, music. Uh, just take that next step, and we, we ought to make it easier. We ought to make that integration, knowledge of other languages, uh, more prevalent uh, in uh, starting in early childhood education. And again, a, a good point, you know, uh, the rebirth of students enrolling in, in language courses, particularly the Chinese languages here at San Francisco State, is at an all-time high. I mean, the, the courses close quickly, um, and students of a variety of all backgrounds are, are starting to think, hmm, world economy, I probably should learn another language, Mandarin, Cantonese, uh, to be part of that developing world. I think you're just right on the, the, the important piece. I'd like your thoughts. You know, we've talked about how food can be a connection between people, languages, the technology, et cetera. Um, any other thoughts? Or what might be other ways to get students from China closer to students from the United States? Uh, just put them together. The uh, 
No wonder our, our universities, uh, as you pointed out, uh, are just extraordinary communities. Uh, and so when you, and that leadership, every professor, you know, creates this dynamic environment, right? So whether it's how you engage with each other, what, what's being, how and what is being taught in the classroom, right? The, you, you'll, watch, you'll watch professors saying, no, open source it, right? It's not only, yes. right, the, not only you work on these projects with individuals that are students in the same classroom, but go out and work with the local community or larger communities, right? Fostering partnerships, fostering the growth of relationships. Uh, and so as that becomes more commonplace, right, the people will overcome, you know, whatever obstacles, uh, real or perceived, that impact them. And oftentimes, uh, you know, my, my best friend is uh, Mexican-American. When I was growing up, I only knew one other Mexican-American, right? The, but you, you just, the, and his uh, introducing me to his family, right, to the community that he grew up in. One of my law school roommates was a, his parents were immigrants from Italy. Uh, mm -hmm. So going back to visit his parents during uh, Christmas, uh, to look at the old Italian and Jewish neighborhoods in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, just was so life uh, fulfilling and inspiring. Uh, and I think once you make that part of the routine of individuals' lives, they'll seek more. You know, you make me think of a number of projects here at the university where students are very interested in researching their own families' historical identity and their own family identities and cultural identities. Uh, even before immigration of, you know, where did great grandpa and great grandma come from and what did they experience, et cetera. And in, in many ways, that's the strength of this country and perhaps many countries. Um, as you said, you know, China is a very diverse country as well. And the interest in family is, is, is actually increasing uh, from what I could tell. Uh, and they're deep sense, right? The, uh, my, my dad was a, very, usually very quiet, but when he would start speaking, he was a storyteller. And w when he was analyzing things, even though he was uh, <clears throat> raised in Taiwan, he knew about all the dynasties in China, right? And right, the uh, as I talked to so many Chinese, that that sense of history of their country, right? This happened during the Qing Dynasty. This happened during the Ming Dynasty, right? And getting a sense of you know where they are today, but where other people were their relatives and others before to get them uh, to that time and place uh, they are. Uh, and so I think that's very exciting. And even though I was a finance undergrad and then went to law school, my favorite undergraduate class was world, world, world cultures, world mm -hmm. civilization, mm -hmm. learning about kibbutzes in Israel, learning about Sunnis and Shiites, the, you know, the, you know, Meiji, Restor Meiji, Rest Meiji Restoration in Japan, uh, all, all of that, right, to get a sense of uh, the world and people. You, you stimulated a very fond memory of my late father yeah, from Guangzhou and um, came to the U.S. as a nine-year-old uh, in, in the 1920s. And throughout my whole life with him, uh, he said, do good in school, et cetera, et cetera. And every time something would happen, he connected to Chinese history. And even uh, to his last days, he always connected things to the, the history of China and the cultural, the idea of uh, your identity as a Chinese person. And um, those were very, just fun stories, uh, whether it was food or et cetera. And, and I said, well, dad, all right, I understand all that. What do you think China needs to do now to step into the future? And he smirked because he was a big baseball fan. And he goes, maybe they ought to start playing baseball more kind of thing. It was, it was a very fascinating uh, uh, interaction with him because he loved uh, America. He loved being Chinese. He loved coming from China and the opportunities that, that arose um, for him. Was he an ace fan? Uh, he was actually, and uh, actually, and spent most of his life in San Francisco. So uh, it was kind of interesting. But uh, uh, I remember him taking me to um, 
my first game, you know, in San Francisco uh, at Seal Stadium. And uh, it was one of the few times that I could see him relax and et cetera. And like your father, uh, my father was a self-made man who came here, got a high school diploma, uh, and really literally went from the janitor of a company, his first job, to its CEO in 30 years, you know, and it was just, you just have to persist. You got to work hard. You got to take care of your family, same values. Yeah. That's pretty phenomenal. From yeah. janitor to CEO. Yeah. Are you, are you A's or Giants? Um, that's a well-kept secret because <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to stay out of trouble. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I, my father was uh, critical in my my own fascination with baseball. I played baseball as a young man, and uh, again, that was that was so interesting because uh, when I was young in in the fifties, et cetera, uh, I played for a championship baseball team in in Oakland, across the bay, um, and I was the only Chinese player in the league, uh, let alone on this particular team. But uh, sport became a way to bridge our differences and bridge our cultures, et cetera. And ironically, uh, San Francisco State has a wonderful relationship with the athletic structures in, in China, particularly with some of the basketball and Olympic training. I was like that. My brother and I, when we were growing up in uh, suburban Chicago, we were the only Chinese Americans uh, in Little League uh, mm. at that time. So I only got to pitch one inning uh, in my little league, the, uh, so, uh, I got the first two batters out and then this is when the Oakland A's were prominent, right? And they had Raleigh fingers. Yeah. So I thought I was going to start submarining. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the, uh, I submarined it and hit the batter and the coach comes out and said, what are you doing? Yeah. And he said, I'm Raleigh fingers. He said, Raleigh fingers, you're out of the game. <laughs> From where you sit, what, what could universities do to help students better prepare themselves for a world, uh, for a world where people are very different, but yet face common issues? I think of students, as we mentioned earlier, work, jobs, family, uh, their own interests, et cetera. Um, and the, the university plays a, a role. We, um, you probably know this, but we're starting to do studies on um, students who are the first in their family to go to school and uh, to go to college. And what's very, very interesting is once that student graduates, another family member graduates soon thereafter. It's almost like that first generation student inspires the family and it just spreads and everyone benefits from that. Um, you know, which is really a nice effect of an education. Yeah, the, the state has to do a better job of providing stability as to what the future is going to look like. What, you know, the planning for not just annually, but, you know, this is what we're going to try to do three years for the next three years. This is what we're going to do for the next five years so that you can plan for the, for the medium term. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things, uh, citing a community college, Imperial Valley Community College, when I went down and toured it, uh, I loved it because they, they called it student success counselors, right? Because, you know, I think that changes the attitude, but you're going to make sure that the, those who are the counselors, they're responsible for student success. And they know to a greater de degree than what I hear most about the students' lives. So they'll know if you're housing challenged, your food challenged. Uh, and so when they're planning and they have, like many others, they'll have, you know, the facilities to provide food, uh, the pantries. Um, and they oftentimes know that a lot of the students are responsible for not only themselves, but other members of their family or their economic situation. So if an uh, individual is food challenged, oftentimes they'll feel guilty because other members of their family don't have food, right? So they may pack, okay, they say nine bags of lunch, right? This is yours, but this is for your other family members. Mm -hmm. So to try to try to bring people's existence uh, to bear to try to make sure that they can continue to progress uh, in a on a pathway uh, that is clear that is a bit easier right it's not never going to be easy but a bit easier so that they can get through to community college and then go to uh, a four-year institution there's a lot of in fact yesterday uh, the United States increased the fees for different types of student visas. 
and it, it almost seems like we're questioning now whether what you and I are talking about is relevant for the future, and it's disturbing for me. I, I, I would love to hear your opinion. I certainly, from my perspective, I would lower the fees for getting student visas to come to the United States and, and figure out a way to encourage, as we mentioned earlier, our U.S. students to get across to China. And it just seems like we're making it more difficult now. Yeah, we make it difficult to come in and we make it difficult to stay. You're looking at, we're, we're, we're graduating these magnificently talented students. They come here, they graduate from San Francisco State University, they graduate from Cal, they graduate from Stanford, they graduate from San Jose State. Often, many of them also, also with the advanced degrees, and then they to, they're told they can't stay here. They, uh, it's great to invest in the world, but you know we, we use public taxpayer dollars to invest in them. They are going to, if given the opportunity to stay in California, make phenomenal contributions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why the state's been successful. And economically, right, if, the, if, if, you, if you don't want to do it as a values purpose, right, or your value is money, it makes sense to keep them here. The, this, we are not reproducing at a rate that is going to grow California's and the United States economy, right? The, our birth rates are simply too low. And so do we want a lower quality of life for each and every American re resident in the future? So why wouldn't we want people who are going to work hard, who dream hard, who accomplish, if they choose to do so, to become Americans? And it's, our, our national leaders just aren't thinking, you know, thoughtfully enough about, you know, these people's lives and the greater context, what America's future should be. One of my uh, last students that I had as a faculty member um, mm -hmm. had room in his curriculum that he didn't know what to take. So I said, you should do something I can't do. And he was puzzled. I said, maybe you ought to take a Chinese language of course, a business major. And he goes, you can take it. Yeah, I could do, I could do that now too, I should. <laughs> we'll take it together. <laughs> I'm still in touch with him today because his first job and his current job has been in China. Excellent, well done. And I thought, well done. by one student, I've touched the future, you exactly. know, in some kind of way. And, and when I see him now, he says, Dr. Wong, when you open that door for me as a business major to learn Mandarin, best thing that happened to me. I'm proud to be working in China. I'm proud to be an American. And it was that one opportunity to take a Chinese language course. It was fascinating. Well, it's just, it's just the connections. I, I went to uh, Munich, Germany a while ago. And I, I just, I went to McDonald's. <laughs> and this high school student served me. I said, God, your English is great. He goes, I speak four languages. Jeez. And I'm thinking, I said, just, we need so much more of that, right? Just people, the ability to connect. You know, there is a lot of talk in U.S. higher education of going back to the days where another language was required, mm -hmm. you know, to, to get your bachelor's degree. And, um, you know, at San Francisco State, 80% of the students probably already have multiple languages. But again, you raise a good point that somehow losing the language or not getting it in some fashion, we don't see how that can be a, a, an important strategic skill to pick up in college. Again, I, my team and I go to China a couple times a year. I'm amazed at how much more English is there, more Spanish, more German, uh, very multilingual. And, and I think that's what's powering the, the Chinese economy. Multiple language, multiple culture piece that you speak of. And, and they're, they're trying to reach out everywhere. You know, the, uh, you know their investment in infrastructure uh, in places, so some countries in Africa have, uh, you know, when you look at percentage growth, have, has really a a catapulted uh, some, uh, some national, national economies. How do you sense the sort of mutual understanding and respect between China and the U.S. And, and where is that taking us in the future? 
the uh, there's a level a, a significant uh, amount of sophistication uh, in all areas, uh, and so our you know when you watch the simplicity and oftentimes uh, too often unfortunately that astute uh, engagement by our national leaders the as we discussed a little bit earlier it's 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 it's, it's important uh, that whether it's in academia whether it's in uh, the business sector whether it's NGOs that you develop those relationships right because mm -hmm. you have deep meaningful uh, interactions that are taking place on nearly every issue on this earth uh, is happening. And, you know, with technology and with our communications tools, uh, it's not like you have to physically be there, right? People are engaging in so many different respects. So uh, it, is, uh, it is something that's going to continue to grow exponentially, and it's going to have huge ramifications. You know, um, it almost seems reasonable, if not strategic, that every U.S. student, college student, be required to have a passport. And somehow we enable them to get outside the boundaries of the United States and, and to see the world, to go to China, to study, spend some time studying abroad. Uh, maybe that will alter that imbalance that we see of far more students from the world from China coming here than students from here going to China. Having visited many universities in China too, it's the energy is still the same. The young people want to learn, they want to be out in the world, they want to do well, et cetera. It's, uh, it's quite fascinating. fascinating. I love running on the Great Wall. Did you? Yeah. The, uh... Every time you go to Beijing, of nearly every trip that I've been to, except for one, went to the Great Wall. The uh, and so, first it's great exercise, but the right the vistas that you're looking, just right the breathtaking. Yeah, oh. and it it changes students. I mean, every student I know of who's traveled abroad comes back. They never forget that. It's like your the your long your lifelong friends. Are the friends you meet in college and if they happen to be from china you're going to go over and see them they're going to come and see you and that in fact that's what laces the world together real nicely you know that common experience on a campus well john the purpose of the confucius institute is to provide chinese language cross-cultural awareness global education uh, programs between china and the u.s there are 107 uh, Confucius Institutes uh, in the United States, and and we're proud at San Francisco of, of the Confucius Institute here. Um, I believe there was a Confucius Institute at your alma mater, University of South Florida. Um, I know we've gotten at it a lot this in in this uh, interview, but. Um, how about some closing comments on the importance you see in language training, the, the presence of the Confucius Institutes on campus, uh, in connecting China, the U.S., and our cultural awareness of each other. Uh, they need a Confucius Institute in Torrance, California, phys with the same physical distance of the one from your office, really <laughs> close. Uh, 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 yeah. But I, I think it's, it's the ideal, right? When you have that, you have people invested in connecting people right there, there's there's a real difference do you want a life that you live in isolation that is not part of something larger uh, or do you want something that is where you're thinking that the opportunities of the world are not constricted mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a fundamentally different premise about who you are as a person and so the Confucius Institute opens the world possibilities, right? That's what this campus, that's what your work, that's what my work is all about. It's who we are as people, right? That's what we do as a daily, uh, on a daily basis, right? And that's why the uh, I've been incredibly pleased, right? Why I said my life was incredibly blessed 
bit. I've, uh, I live a life that I would never imagined. And so when you have the Confucius Institute, when you have San Francisco State University, uh, why wouldn't you, you know, take full advantage of what life's presenting to you, right? It's on a platter, mm -hmm. right? You have an opportunity to explore, to create, to live a bigger, better life. The Confucius Institutes for me represent that powerful linkage of talent and opportunity on a college campus. Uh, and it has been so productive for San Francisco State to, and it does exactly what you're saying. I mean, it is a mechanism uh, by which powerful outcomes can occur. Yeah. You talked about the, you know, the person, uh, the student uh, mm -hmm. to take a, that China, was it Mandarin or Cantonese? It was actually Mandarin. Yeah, Mandarin, take the Mandarin course, right? Yeah. That, uh, that transformed his life. Life-changing event. Exactly. John, any closing comments? Oh, the, uh, you know, we, we live in a world, it's, it's uh, July 2018, uh, where my mom's life lesson is put great people in your life. Uh, if you put great people in your life, it, it will make you happier. You will be more successful. Uh, and so don't waste moments. Mm. Don't, wa don't waste the moments. And, uh, you know, in my first week uh, in elected office, my, my sister was kidnapped and murdered. Mm. Uh, the, uh, and so, you know, a lot of my life I live in love. For my sister and the opportunities, the you know, she would have done a, amazing good. She was the person that I know was uh, closed the distance between two people really rapidly, uh, and so you know, as long as uh, as I say, as long as you can take another breath on this earth, uh, you're given something special, and so make the most of it. John, it's been an honor to to interview you, and it's an honor to and a, to have you as a friend. It's always fun to be. Thank here. you. Thank you, Jen. Yes. Thank you.